Today, we will do a deep dive into the early education system in Canada through the eyes of an elementary school teacher. Nikki will share insights about how teachers work, being flexible and planning to change a plan, how the education system is structured, and of course, how could we not go without talking about sex education and what it is and isn't in Canada. Instead of asking their parents, they go onto Google instead. Grab a cup of something delicious and let's get started. Can yep. you quickly walk us through what does the overall earlier education system look like in Canada? Yeah, you start at school and you go into kindergarten. So kindergarten, you're maybe four turning five around that age. In kindergarten, you have junior kindergarten and then senior kindergarten. So it's a full day program. So you're there at school all day and, you know, the kids are just learning to, you know, be around other kids. They're learning how to socialize. They're learning, they're getting familiar with what's around them and any learning tools that they have. So kindergarten is the first two years and then you've got your primary years, which is grades one, two and three. And your primary years are really your formative years. You're getting the building blocks and you're understanding like big ideas, big concepts. And then once you move into the junior years, which is grades four, five, and six, you start to refine that a bit more and it becomes a little more specific. Seven and eight, uh, you jump into the intermediate years. Eight is the cutoff before high school. And then high school, once you go into secondary school, nine to 12. Like you're in school for a long time. Uh, but elementary school typically, you know, goes up to grade eight. It seems like the earlier years are more focused on the personality forming, I guess, and the community, the ability to kind of exist within the community. Yep. And, and then the later years are focused more on academia. Is the, would that be a fair way to explain it? I mean, you're still doing academia and you're still doing a lot of uh, subject content. As of grade one, that's when you start having all those dedicated subjects. I'm talking about the human body and I'm teaching them the four specific like major systems of the human body system. If you were to, if you were to dial that back to grade one you're just talking about parts of the body what do you have on your body this is a hand yeah how is your body different to other people same idea big concept because you're just talking about a human body and its existence but certain areas and the way you're finding it is different because mm. it's you no know, age appropriate for that grade uh, but you're still doing science you're still doing math and language all the way through. It just starts to get a little more specific as, as you get older. Does the, um, the methodology of teaching change over the years? If you sat at a table with a kindergarten, a primary and a junior teacher, and even an intermediate teacher, if they're teaching grade seven and eight, you could definitely tell the difference. Methodology is drastically different and the way that things are structured and the way teachers will set up their classroom for primary and for kindergarten students is very different to how junior teachers will do it. So for me, it might be more what you remember where you're like, you're sitting at a desk, you have work to do, you have somebody speaking to you. Um, that's the more, more like the setup of my classroom. In primary classrooms, you know, you'll have a carpet and it's more, you know, you have carpet work or you have group works, you have tables. And instead of necessarily having individual tables for each kid, you have table groups and, you know, this is a learning station. And then you move to this station. There's a math table, there's a science table, there's a language table, and it's more theme oriented in, in a way. And then in kindergarten classrooms, uh, you know, they're there's pretty much no desk and it's all like it's play based in kindergarten. So when they're only three or four, sorry, four or five years old, they're just learning how to interact with each other more than they're learning what's the difference between soil and like plants and animals. You know, that is part of it, but you know, they're, they're learning how to share and how to be around other people. In primary, uh, you know, you're learning, making sure that you got the alphabet down, your letters uh, properly, you're able to write words in primary. Uh, and towards the end of grade one, you're already writing sentences. So that in grade two, you're writing sentences, you're writing three or four sentences. Then in grade three, you can write a paragraph. Then in grade four, when you get to me, you're writing me essays. So you're taking what you've learned all the way back in grade one and you're just building on it and building on it. The science curriculum is different because you talk about different topics, but there are like kind of four overarching themes. I'm teaching the human body to my grade fives and I'm teaching uh, animals, habitats and communities to the grade fours. So it's not directly linked, but there's, you know, an aspect of but like mammals and just like, you know, humanity that kind of ties it ties both of them together so sometimes you know especially if you're teaching a split classroom like i am so i have a small group of fours and then half the other half of my class is grade five um you know sometimes the curriculum lines up and sometimes it doesn't so it's a it's a balancing act trying to teach it how many classes do you teach at the same time in the term my one class has 22 kids in it seven of 22 are grade four students and then the other 15 are grade five students so i'm teaching two different curriculums at the same time. For me, when I talk about you know, responsibility and expectations at the start of the year, another one I really, really harp on is independent work and being independent because they know that if I'm working with a super, certain group of kids, I can't work with you at that moment. Like I need you to figure out a way to work through your and like solve your problems 
without me so I can you know get through the other curriculum as well. And is that a common thing to happen where you have different grades of children hanging out in the same classroom being taught different things? It's a common practice and I, I don't think every school has it but I think it depends on numbers and how many kids you have. In your primary years we have what we call a cap which means you have to you have to cap it at a certain number of kids uh, which is about 20 but in the junior grades you do not have a cap so I have some colleagues that have 31 kids in their class and I don't know how they get anything done because I had I personally had 29 last year and I was drowning all year like this year I could finally relax a bit it would be astronomically you know difficult to have a class of 36 and I don't think they would allow it so because of the way the numbers worked out they decided to make two split classes rather than have one massive and one small class. As a teacher what do you wish you had more time for? I wouldn't mind having a sleep, a nap period. I think my kids would love it as well. And I wish I had more time to allow myself a bit more freedom and not to be so rigid about what I need to teach. The way the Ontario uh, Ministry of Education has it set up is like they're the ones that decide this is what you learn in grade four, this is what you learn in grade five across all the subjects. So that's, that's up to their discretion to decide. We're given this document that says, should learn about you know human body function. That's really a subject to interpretation based on the teacher. So the way I interpret that will be different to how my teaching partner, who teaches a different four or five class, will teach it. So there is a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of room to, you know, to how we want to interpret it and how we want to go about it. But, you know, you still have to meet the expectations. So my class might achieve this expectation by doing a final summative project. Her class might achieve it by writing a quiz or going to the science center and learning about it that way. It depends on, you know, you have to know your kids and you have to know what they can achieve and what you can actually work with them. It looks like the teacher's job is really challenging because there's no specific structure in how your term is going to play out because there's so yep. many different moving pieces. Yep. And in the end of the day, it all depends on the combination of children that you have and yep. what kind of relationships you're able to build. Absolutely. And that to me is probably the most challenging thing on earth just to deal with, not just humans, but also children, humans. Yep. How do you wish your job was different or easier? What would you like to change? A big one is class size. Our budget, all this has been cut down. Current government of Ontario don't believe that, you know, it's important to have that. When mm. really that's just, it's incredibly damaging to our kids and the access to, the re, uh, to resources that our kids may or may not have because of those decisions. French resources are hard to come by. You know, as prominent as French immersion is in Ontario, you know, there still is not a lot out there. And just having the resources and the funding for special education programs, like we have so many students that suffer just being in a classroom. It's really difficult for them to be in that environment. And sometimes uh, they need to be in a more specialized program or they need to work one-on-one -on -one with a specialized individual. And they're cutting our funding. They're, you know, we're having less and less people in our buildings there to help the kids. And at the end of the day, that's what our job is for. We're there for the kids. And when we don't have those resources and it's, you no, know, it's just super damaging to, to the kids. Potentially damaging to the teacher's overall well-being as well, because there's just so much work and pressure. So the Ministry of Education tells you, here are the types of things you you need to teach the children but then it's up to you to figure out <laughs> what yep. that actually looks like exactly yeah it's 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 all a balancing act there's a lot of balancing there's a lot to figure out by yourself is being able to do something but if you notice it's not working to be able to change it like pretty mm -hmm. quick so that you can find a different way to make it either more engaging At, my job is that you get it that you have access to it in some way and that you finally understand it and if it's not through my words i hope it's through somebody else so it's not just the teacher that the the, the system is encouraging children to learn from it's yep. also their peers yep. that oh, they interact absolutely. with absolutely yep i do my best to like create a community they know that i'm not superwoman i don't have all the answers but their peers are an excellent tool that they might have a different interpretation of it. They might have a better understanding and a better explanation for things than me. That is so interesting because in some cultures, well, definitely in a culture like ours, a teacher is always this figure of authority who yeah. actually has all the answers, yes. who knows everything. And that's how the entire education system and maybe other systems are also built on. So this to me feels so fundamentally different. How do you make sure that children learn, that children are disciplined in the first place, that, the teacher, yeah. uh, that, that children and respect the teacher and the system and the program overall. Maybe that's more of a personal thing and I know there are some teachers that are more authoritative than I, but on top of being, you know, more open and more lenient to like working with the kids as opposed to, you know, being up there and you're down here. It all comes with building community and that's really what the first month of school is like for me. It's not so much curriculum based. You're really just trying to establish relationships with the kids and just get a mutual understanding and develop mutual respect for one another. So on the very first day of school, you know, I, you know, we talk about what does that mean, mutual respect? Like, I respect you 
what does that mean? How do you show respect? And how do you show it back to me? Um, and, you know, there is, you know, kids understand, like, they're at school, there are certain expectations that you have to follow. But those expectations also have to be said out loud. So that's, this is one of those things that they've heard it over and over again. But we're constantly having the same conversation about, you know, in class, you raise your hand if you want to share ideas or you need to ask permission to do certain things. Like, very open and I'm very clear with them. Like, there are 23 of you and there's one of me. So there are certain things that everybody needs to abide by. I have my own set of rules and guidelines that I need to follow. You have your own set of rules and guidelines. So let's make them up together. So we, you know, do we develop lists together? I said, what are the expectations that you need to follow? What are your expectations of me? And then we try to match them. So we're on the same playing field and we're just moving along that way. And again, like it's not every teacher that does that. Building that aspect of mutual respect and building that community gives me that authority. They know that I can be more open and more playful or, you know, more chatty to do certain things. But then when push comes to shove, this is what they need to do. This is the expectation right now. Same goes for, you know, behavior issues. Like there are a lot of behaviors that come up in the classroom, especially with the age that I teach. Like they're nine turning 10, 10 turning 11. So emotionally, socially, there are huge things that are changing for them. So, you know, just being able to find common ground with one another, you know, talk about what does it mean to be friends with multiple people? Can you have friends that not everybody is friends with? Do you have to be friends with everybody? You know, it's all part of building community and it's all based on respect. And we've had, you know, we just recently did a writing unit on opinions and I said, you can have your opinion, but we talked about what it meant to agree to disagree, but they do have to respect that that's your opinion. When they're sharing their opinion, that's essentially stating fact that that's what they believe. You might disagree and that's fine. So you agree to disagree and you move on. So in terms of, you know, authority uh, and just, you know, structure, I think having those set guidelines, guidelines and expectations that we set together sets the tone for really how the rest of the year goes. Definitely the education system here is focuses not just on the academic aspect of that, but also on the relational yeah. aspect. How do you exist in a society, essentially? Yeah. A lot of soft skills. I mean, that's actually partially what they're evaluated on, on their report cards. Mm -hmm. So on the provincial report card, on the first page, we have six learning skills. So that's uh, responsibility, organization, collaboration, self-regulation, independence and initiative. All of these soft skills building into, you know, how do you become a better person, you know, a better working person, working with other people, do you take initiative? Are you organized with your time? Are you organized with like your physical space? Like there are additional, like those learning skills are just as important as subject content that, they, that we do. Cause they're evaluated on what I'd say roughly about eight subjects. And then the six learning skills are actually what you see first. But every one of them, can absolutely succeed at being able to do things just in their own way. So I spend more time actually focusing on their learning skills and trying to better understand them as a learner than I do just curriculum content stuff. You're talking about them as a person and that's really important for them to understand. It's really important for their parents to understand like who their kid is. And I guess part of your job is also making sure that you communicate all of that to the parents. Yeah. That's, a, that's also a fun part is the, the number of emails I usually get per day. Sending uh, emails every two weeks out to the parents, just giving them a lowdown of just saying, this is what we achieved these last two weeks. This is what we're moving towards. Like we may get to this this week, mm -hmm. we might not. Parent communication is, is really, really key, especially at this age as well. They're still really young. I have to remind myself that they're still nine, 10 and 11 year olds in front of me. I'm really fortunate to have some fantastic parents in my corner. Like they are really very, like they're very involved, which is a great thing because they want their kid to achieve and they want their kid to be successful. You know, they just want to know like what's happening. Like, how can I help? I always tell the kids, you know, if you're not sure what we're talking about here, your parents are a great resource. If I find a kid is struggling uh, in a certain subject area or really need, needs a push and I'll send them a quick email, say like, hey, like, you know, I've just noticed that they're slipping and they're having a harder time. Let me know if you're seeing the same thing. We can either have a phone call conversation. We could have a call or we could have a meeting like you, me and your child and we can just talk about it together. We can look at some work samples. I don't want it to make it seem like all my emails are negative. Finding something that this specific kid did really, really well one day and then sending an email out to the parents saying, hey, just want to let you know, hey, they did really well. If they don't know, it's worse. <laughs> it's, you definitely, it's easier for them to, you know, have the email chain and for them to be in the know of what's been going on in the classroom because their kids aren't always going to tell them, right? Like a lot of kids will come home and they'll say, oh, how was your day at school? They'll say, fine. So I've had some parents tell me that like, oh, like, you know, it's only through your emails that I know what you're doing because my kid won't say otherwise. My kids do, you know, quizzes, uh, or tests or assignments like in my class and I send it home. I ask them to send it back. So I have the parents sign it, read whatever I've written in terms of comments 
and then send it back to me. So again, they're kept in the loop. If they haven't, that shows me responsibility wise based on their kid, why aren't you bringing it home for your parents to see? And so if they don't know and they are surprised, then it's a whole different conversation. It's, I try to make sure that the responsibility is on the kids and the onus is more on the kids than it is on me because that's part of their soft skills, it's part of their learning skills that they need to develop. Do you see parents have any strong say into how they think you should teach a certain subject or whether you should spend more time on a certain thing than others? They know generally what their kids are going to do throughout the year, but I don't think they're particularly picky that, you know, you need to do it this way or you need to do it that way. You know, they can be more specific about, you know, my kid would learn better this way. Mm. Like they might learn better with more auditory support or they might learn better with more kinesthetic support, like fidgeting with something. That's on me then to try and figure out ways to incorporate that. And it's not always possible to do in the classroom. Like most often what I do is you know, audio visual related, like I'll talk and they'll have something in front of them or I'll talk and then they'll go do something. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's kinesthetic. Um, it just depends on resources that you have and access that you have in your class. The other ways, you know, I didn't do this last year, but I've been doing this year is going on field trips and, you know, having uh, experts tell us about something. You know, we went to the AGO and we learned how to do calligraph printing. So they were using paint and they were using different uh, textured cardboard and they're doing like a really fun art activity. Something that you could do in the classroom yourself, but to have somebody else, like a third party there explaining it to the kids, it just adds a whole other level of excitement for them when they're doing something and they're being challenged to do something in that way. So that's not just me all the time, that there's somebody else also that has more knowledge than me that are able to share their passion and they're able to do something fun with them as well. Are there any things that parents are most concerned about that you see happening over and over again? In terms of major concerns though, COVID really, really, really hit this group of kids hard. Because when COVID initially hit and they had what, two and a half, maybe three years of kind of on and off mixed schooling, these guys were in grades one, two, and three. And because I work with French second language learners, uh, not all of them have access to hearing French outside of school. So that took a really, really big hit on their ability to learn a language, in addition to all the social aspect of, you know, learning at that age. So a lot of them are really concerned of, you know, are they falling behind? Do they need extra help? Um, should I be getting my kid, you know, tutored uh, and just, you know, finding other ways to help them? My answer is always yes. Some parents, unfortunately, just don't have the time to do it. So if they have the means and they have other people and access to resources that could help their kid, I'm 100% uh, supportive of it. In grades one, two, and three, especially for French language learners, like I'm sure it is for, you know, learning any language, like that's where the foundational learning blocks happen in terms of, you know, language or reading, like they're all kind of a year or two behind because they just missed that, that really crucial block of time where this would have propelled them forward and it would have gotten all the, you know, you know, super repetitive things about learning a language like grammar. It would have gotten all that out of the way. So I'm still, you know, I'm correcting things and I'm seeing mistakes in grammar that are so easily fixable that to me, this is something that you would have, you know, hashed out and you would have, you know, refined this in primary years, but they missed all that because they're stuck doing it online or they're stuck doing it hybrid, they're doing it in a mask. For language learners, you know, of any language, you know, being able to see somebody's, uh, you know, facial movements is crucial. So for them, like it really, it really, really hit hard and the parents, uh, generally speaking, are concerned about that. Do the children themselves realize that they have a little bit of that gap? I think some do and others don't. There's always a big range in classrooms. You have a group of kids that really excel and are doing really well. You have the bulk of the class that's right in the middle and, you know, are following along. They have no problem. And then you've got another group of kids at the bottom who are like just barely scraping by and like barely meeting expectations. A bell curve. Yeah, for sure. And I think part of what I have to do in terms of building community and establishing community in the classroom is you know, having them understand that even though there are people in this classroom that don't get it as quickly as you, it doesn't mean they're not going to get it. It just means that it's going to take them a little longer to get there. So I need my guys at the top to help my guys at the bottom. Or I need some kids that are in the middle that are closer to the top or like some kids, you know, that are maybe just hovering right around the middle to help those that are like really struggling. And that's establishing another sense of community is building relationships between the kids, helping them find out, you know, who can they go to that's not just me that can help them out. In many instances, it does help build friendships and it builds better relationships, which is ultimately the goal. This is really fascinating because you're really instilling that sense of building community uh, from the very early ages where children are encouraged, not just to look up to a certain authority, be it a teacher or even a parent, yeah. but also people around you and people in your classroom, yeah. which makes me think that the people who have you in your classroom are really having a big influence on, 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 on you, essentially. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like I have, 
kids of all different personality types in my classroom and I absolutely love the kids that I have in my class and the kids that I had last year in my class were fantastic as well but I think it it relieves uh some pressure off of you when you're able to kind of pinpoint and say like hey you know try asking try asking this person they might have a better answer than me or try asking them because my explanation didn't work maybe theirs will and they'll do a better job at it than I did. I'm so completely open to them exploring with each other rather than just depending solely on me. You know, that's part of learning as well. That's part of being a, an active member in society is learning how to figure things out based on your environment and based on what's around you. Um, so I think the best way to do that is to practice and to practice you know, with other people. And you know, it works out sometimes and it doesn't others. Like some kids are more receptive to it than others. And that's just part of, you know, personality. That's just part of their age. Uh, but I'm slowly chipping away at it so they see, you know, your teacher's not the only person with answers. There are so many other people around you that you can use as learning tools, not just as distractions that because they're because they're your friends. Like you can absolutely use them to help you propel yourself forward. That makes me think about our Russian uh, education system where we were actually penalized for just chatting with our classmates yeah. uh, who we sit right next to right next to or talking too much and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's impacted the way we were raised as a society. We just ended up maybe a little bit more sociophobic, maybe yeah. to an extent, and maybe have not developed the social skills that we need to even succeed in a, in a Western environment like the Canadian environment. Mm. And you guys are taking a, a 180 degree different approach. I want to zoom a little bit more into those kind of three groups of children you have in your yep. classroom. Kind of those, those are uh, are excelling, those are there in the middle and aren't doing that well. How do you decide on which group to focus on? Is there a specific guideline for which group you should be focusing on more? The goal is ultimately that all kids can access it and can get it at some point. It's a it's a balance being able to move on and move forward even though not every kid gets it. So we were recently doing, uh, my best example would be, we were talking about multiplication and division. It's a really big unit and you know, there are various ways to do multiplication. There's various ways to do division. So I showed them as many different strategies as I could. It doesn't bother me which one you use as long as you're showing me what your thinking is and you're showing me your steps, I really don't care. Like it's, I, I just want you to be able to access it and do it in whichever way makes you more comfortable. And so that you want to make sure that all your lessons and the way you teach, it's accessible in different ways. So you're doing the same lesson, but there's an audio part, there's a visual part, there might be a kinesthetic aspect to it. So kids all have different abilities and they all have different ways that they learn. So we have to be uh, receptive to it. We have to be flexible in the way we teach and we have to be able to, you know, change on the fly if we need to and be able to adapt something a certain way to help that kid access it. We have to start with the basics no matter how many times they might have heard it over and over again. You have to you know, make sure that everybody has the same baseline understanding and then building up from that so they can get to a point where they can be more independent, they can be more critical, think outside the box and you know, think more abstractly than normally you would. From that, I'm able to kind of decipher you know, which kids are having trouble and which kids are really getting it. Kids love to pick. Who they work with in terms of groups so sometimes you know it's a 50 50 i'll let them choose or i will choose myself and it's not a case of me specifically working on a certain group of kids it's trying to figure out how do i get all of them to work together so that everybody can feel some kind of success or feel, feel like they accomplished something in that period that we were working on it so you know i'll make sure that if i'm the one making the groups i've got a really strong kid a kid in the middle and then a really weak kid that are all in the same group so i know the first two will get it pretty quick but their goal is after they finish it, they need to make sure that their third member gets it and they can both try explaining it. They can both show how they did it, explain their thinking. But that third, per that third person will then have two other people in front of them able to help. Some kids work well together and other kids don't. So part of my job is also playing around with groupings and who will work with what personalities, who is more receptive to working with certain people. Because I have, you know, kids are stubborn, just like adults. I have some kids that are really stubborn and won't work with other people unless it's their friends. But of course, this all comes back to, you know, you know, using theory and using differentiated instruction. Because I will have a, a group of kids that excel and like finish whatever I've asked, like in a second. So what do they do? That's not just, you know, making sure they help other people. Because I can't just dish out my job to, you know, getting them to help other people all the time. It's not, you know, it's not really a challenge for them. It's not exciting for them. So what I can do in those instances, you know, for the kids that are really, really getting it, I'll say, if you finish early, and this is a generalization to the whole class, so I'm not singling them out either. I said, if you finish early, 
you can try this project. Or I'll have like a small, um, you know, extra worksheet for them to work on or something a little different, something more creative, something more artistic. Um, that's not just rudimentary math, mm -hmm. if that's what we're working on. And so when they're done, they know that they can go work on this. But something that we also have in the Ontario uh, education system is called gifted placement. It determines which kids think at a higher processing speed. Uh, and so we call them gifted if they score above a certain uh, number of points. Within that, you can go into a gifted placement, which is essentially a different school. And in this school, you're doing the same exact curriculum that we'd be doing in a regular classroom. So it's a little more open to interpretation and the kids have a little less structure um, because it's more, you know, what can you do with what we're giving you? So here's the general guideline and now you fill in the blanks with everything else. Some parents opt to move their kid into this placement and others don't. In my situation, a lot of the parents choose not to send their kids into a separate gifted placement school because it doesn't have French immersion. These kids already have a higher processing speed. They get things done super quick. What am I gonna give them to do? Um, so I'll have conversations with them and we'll make passion projects on the side. I'll say, tell me what you're really interested in. You know, let's set some really vague guidelines. I wanna make sure that you understand what this, this, this is compared to this, this, and this. You've got two weeks. When you're finished your work, go work on your project. So on top of having that added sheet for certain kids, those kids that have been, you know, flagged as being gifted have this other project that they've chosen that they're already interested enough about, that they're already intrinsically motivated enough to work on, I can trust we'll work on that. And you know, it's a conversation between the two of us. I'm like, would you like to share this with the class or would you like to share it with just me? Do you want it to be a PowerPoint presentation? Do you want to make a poster? Do you want to write a poem about it? Like it's very, it's very open to interpretation and it's really just to help those kids that are way up there already do something that pushes them and challenges them a bit more because it's so vague and open to interpretation. They're busy, the group in the middle is busy. I can come back to working with those group of kids that are really struggling. But also, you know, at the end of the day, I have to move on. <laughs> Like, I can't just do division or multiplication until they get it. Well, it just means that next year, you're gonna have a better understanding already because you've done this. I've gotta move on and do something different now. And so just kind of getting them into a better mindset, not being competitive and not comparing themselves to other people because I know that's, once we get into high school and once we get into undergraduate studies, whether that's in college or like any kind of post-secondary degree, it, everything starts to get competitive. Everything starts to just be a comparison between me versus others and I'm trying to break that down from a very young age. That has nothing to do with anybody else, it's just you. Interesting. So when you talk about just evaluating the children in the end of each year, so you've mentioned there's this kind of learning ability and then yep. there's the academic um, grading. How does that happen? Is there a um, preset way of deciding where does each children score in there? Or do you evaluate children compared to everyone else as a teacher? I teach the kids not to compare with each other. So assessment and evaluation, we try to base it off what we call the triangulation of assessment. Now I'm thinking back to my teacher's college days, uh, which is observation, conversation, and product. So observing the kids, what are they doing in class? Conversation, like talking with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, doing conferences or doing check-ins with them. And then product, what are they actually able to produce? So we try to base our assessment and evaluations on those three things and not solely on this one test. It's based on oh, what have they done in the class? Have they participated? Have they been you know, engaging what we're doing? Are they watching? Are they listening? Like we try to encompass all of it. So when it comes to their report cards, they get three a year. The first one is called a progress report, which goes through the six learning skills. And on the back, it does, it's a very, very brief description of like what we might've covered at that time. And instead of giving a letter grade, which is normally what you do for elementary school, you get three columns, progressing with difficulty, progressing well, progressing very well. And so this is, it's very early in the year because we were set to do it in mid-October is when we're supposed to start those progress reports. So, you know, you just have to flag, basically, are they struggling a lot in this certain subject? Are they doing okay, like they're in the middle? Or are they really standing out? In terms of assessment and evaluation, we are given guidelines. So, you know, we'll get structures for what is a level one, two, three, and four. A level four would be the highest uh, grade that you, that you can get. And... For elementary school, we base it off of letter grades, so it's A, B, C, D. I'll develop a rubric with the kids, you know, what success criteria should there be based on this project that we're doing. So we're doing a writing assignment. So what are, what are the success criteria? Like, you know, you need to have had edited your work. You need to have had done like a rough draft or you've gone through like this graphic organizer to organize all your ideas. Um, that's part of the success criteria is going through each step. Part of it as well is, you know, are your thoughts coherent? Like, does it make sense? 
grammatically. Did you conjugate your verbs in the correct tense, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm creating it with them so that when I go to assess it, I'm not assessing it compared to other, other kids. I'm assessing it based on, did you do exactly what we discussed that you would do? By Ontario standards, if you are doing exactly what's being asked of you, that's a level three, it's equivalent to a B. If you're going beyond that, then we go up to the B plus A range. If you are doing less than that, you're going towards the B minus C range. So one of the success criteria that we had in our rubric was uh, we were doing riddles and they had to, one of the success criteria was I have to have four clues in my riddle. So I have some kids that wrote three. I have some kids that wrote six. So it's not based off of what are the other people doing, it's based off of did you follow the guidelines that we set. I personally don't like to give a lot of uh, A's on my report card. Uh, I think there's always room for improvement for, for kids and having like a full A student just gives them an ego boost that they don't need at this age, really. Like they, they all are working towards things, they're all working to be better. Um, I have some kids that are definitely stronger in certain subjects, but you know, struggle in others. So, you know, their grades are based off their progress over the course of a term. It's based off what I'm seeing in their class. It's based off of conversations that I'm having with them. And it's based off of what are they actually producing. So when it comes to evaluations, like it's a hot topic with a lot of my friends. I don't often put a grade on what I sent home. So they'll have a rubric and the rubric will, you know, I'll circle if it's in like the level three column, the level four column, like that's more obvious. But if it's like a math test or a science test, for example, I actually don't put a score on it. And the reason I have told the kids, the reason I do that is because the second I put a numerical value on this, you're going to get your paper. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to turn to the person beside you and look and see what they got. And I don't want you to do that. Every kid learns differently. Not every kid is oriented towards math. Not every kid is oriented, uh, oriented towards science. So that shouldn't just be solely reflected on their mark, nor should it have social implications. It is, yeah, it's a weird idea because I know yeah. I myself, I'm used to having a grade right smack on my on my test if you find that you did not do well on your on your test bring it home try it again don't erase your answers because i want to see that you actually tried to work on it and add to it i'll reconsider it and i'll bump your mark this isn't the end product that you might not have done well it might have you know they might have had a bad day there's a balance between assessment and evaluation. Every teacher also does it differently, the way they record things. That sounds like a lot of work and just a lot of different things to keep in mind. That creates a perfect segue for us to maybe talk a little bit about what does a, a term in a teacher's life look like? Oof. Okay. <laughs> it's set up a little differently in elementary school than it is in high school because high school students have exams, whereas elementary students, it kind of it, it's just kind of continuous throughout the entire year. So a term would just, you know, it would look like approximately four months. What are you realistically going to achieve in four months? So generally here are the themes that we're gonna try and get through. These are the units that we are gonna try and get through. And then try to, you know, throw in some assessments like, you know, maybe we'll do a listening activity here. Maybe it'll be a final summative project. Maybe it'll be a group project or it'll be a presentation of some sort. Throughout the term, you're working towards achieving those goals so that you have something concrete, right? You have to, be adaptable and be flexible to how they're doing and receptive to maybe we need to do this longer or maybe this isn't taking as much time. Over the course of a term, you're you're just, you're constantly evaluating yourself and you're constantly judging, okay, do I have time to complete this or should I skip this and move on to this now? So does that mean that in each term, there's different amount of things that children will have learned by? Within a term, you're trying to complete like X number of units. The issue is, is that at the start of the year, again, like September is really, really hard. You're trying to just establish routines and you're trying to establish expectations. So because it's less curriculum, you've already lost a month. <laughs> and then you're just trying to play catch up for the rest of the year. Like, okay, what can I achieve? And then it becomes a question, do I do this surface level? Or do I actually take the time to like dive deeper into the subject and let them explore it a bit more? And that's all part of your professional judgment. So teaching is really entirely based on professional judgment. So when you have more experience, you have a better understanding of what are kids more receptive to, what should you be spending more time on, and what should you be spending less time on. Uh, so over the course of the term, you're constantly changing plans. Like this works or it doesn't. So it's all, it's all planning and then being flexible and planning to change your plan. And I guess it's, it's just kind of, you go with the flow, you see what... Absolutely. Like, it's all, like, the the biggest quality that they, that they you know, stress about being a teacher is being able to be flexible. Yeah. How do you do all of that? Because it sounds like it's a very challenging and very energy-consuming type of work. I'm still learning. 
It's it's not something I do very well all the time. I that's why I tell my kids I'm like I'm still figuring out how, how to do things. You are still learning how to do things. Like some things work and some things don't. So I ran a lesson and I could see them like all like falling asleep by the end of it. And so I asked them at the end I'm like, "Okay, so who actually got anything out of that?" And like I had three of them put up their hands so like, "Cool. What would you change next time? How can I do it better? Tell me what would have made this more interesting for you. Do it better than I did." And that's a great motivation. I said, "Do it better than the teacher." And then they're all like kind of like, "Okay, what can we do? We're going to do it way better than she did and we're going to do this 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 and this." But then you're also your job is to make sure that whatever they come up with is aligned with your general curriculum. Exactly. And 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 I'll tell them, I said, "You know, give me your ideas. Let's talk about it. Maybe it works and maybe it doesn't." But when you give them when you take the time to explain the why, like they're very receptive to it and I think that builds on their respect for you and it builds on the authority that you they have for you because they know that you're going to listen to them and you know their ideas might not be the one that's chosen but you are there for them and also tangentially it looks like you're uh training them you're coaching them on negotiation skills as yeah. well <laughs> <laughs> i mean sometimes that works in my favor and other times it does not uh because some of them definitely are are quite vocal and and love to have their ideas shared but you know it's it's all part of you know real life experience right yeah. like this is what they this is what happens outside the the doors of the school and i tell them like you know all these things that we're talking about it's not just because you know the ministry of education that made our curriculum documents that decided that you're going to learn this here it's not just because of them it's because outside these doors all of this compiles into your life like this is the best place for you to practice and it's the best place you know no judgment and you know you might get in trouble and that's how you learn from your mistakes and that's all part of it but this is the best place to practice because in reality outside these doors you're going to have to use all these what makes or breaks your love for a certain subject or even for a certain thing is the uh, the teacher essentially yeah. themselves and, and how passionately they are able to talk about those subjects so does that mean that for every single teacher out there that teaches um at your grade level uh, there's teachers who basically have different strengths and different specializations i guess or different backgrounds absolutely yep becoming a teacher you know i have a bachelor of science other teachers have bachelor of arts with different specifications so we all come from you know our our training and our undergraduate can be very different regardless of the, whether or not this is something you're passionate about you you're still expected to teach uh you know xyz for a certain grade so you're teaching science you're teaching arts you were teaching yeah. are you teaching physical education <laughs> i wish i was uh but at our school the way it's set up we have a gym a dedicated gym teacher so uh he does gym and health and are you guys giving the equal importance to all of those subjects overall in the french immersion program that i'm running 90% of their day is in french except for the 40 minute english period that we have so french is french language is easy to incorporate when you're doing social studies when you're doing science when you're doing math because there's lang- there's a language component to all of that but then you know you have to dedicate math blocks science blocks social studies blocks and make sure that you're hitting you know uh and checking off all the boxes that you need to that you need to achieve uh do you have uh, subjects that you're a little bit more passionate about than others i love to teach science And I think that just comes from having graduated with a science degree, uh especially biology related. Uh I'm currently teaching the human body to my group of grade 5s and I'm so incredibly interested and passionate about it that I'll, you know, catch myself going on tangents about random things that I just, you know, flutter into my head and I realize I look over at them like, "Okay, I've lost you." I had a lot of fun talking about it, but this means nothing to you. And other times they're like, "Oh, I want to learn more. Like, what does that mean? Let's can we talk about that even more?" I'm so like incredibly passionate about teaching French and just making sure that the French language and just giving them as many opportunities to hear it. What about the stuff you hate teaching? A drama dance teacher. I have, you know, it's I'm just not creative and very confident in that in that way. And what is drama? just getting kids to understand what does it mean to be in character and how can you develop the personality and the persona of somebody else you know parts of that was also improv like being able to bounce off ideas from one another and just you know soft skills and also being able to be more adaptable and be more flexible it all comes back to the learning skills that we're constantly observing of them i know some teachers have used like you know old old school like just dance videos and have the kids like dance them on the screen and that's probably as far as i'd be able to stretch as well i don't think uh i do very well there's i guess there's two types of classes there's somewhere like it's you're almost guaranteed to 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 be uh better and more experienced than a student but i guess in cases like drama for example there might be cases where the student is much better absolutely <laughs> than you are for example at drama how does that what kind of dynamic does that create where a student you know it depends on how you play your cards it can go really well because you can work with that kid and make them feel like you know they really like they might struggle in other subject areas but this might be the one thing that they're really good at 
So that gives them a huge confidence boost and it builds a really good relationship between you and the kid if you pinpoint that one thing that they're really awesome at and you get to highlight that. Or it could go the other way where, you know, they're kind of just like telling you what to do the whole time and you're not very receptive about it. So it's really based on how the teacher interprets it. But of course, there's always levels to that. Like, you know, you'd have to do research. Uh, you know, yeah. as the drama teacher, you still have to know what curriculum you have to hit and what are the expectations that you're supposed to do at that age. So, you know, there's a certain level of like, you need to know something and you can also, you know, pull on and ask the kids to give you a hand. In high school, then you have one, you know, you have a math department, you have a science department. And so your teacher for that subject is, you know, specific towards mm -hmm. that. Uh, in elementary school, you're a homeroom teacher. So you're expected to teach across the board, all those subjects. Apart from drama, are there any other subjects you don't particularly like to teach? My, my students right now, my kids right now are going through like a portion of health. And the way health is set up, there's an aspect of health, like your personal like body health, you know, eating healthy, exercising, and what does that mean? Why is it beneficial? And then there's the sex ed component to it. Honestly, I think you can make it a lot of fun. I know a lot of people shy away from it and they don't think it's a great idea. A lot of people might misinterpret as sex ed is that we're not teaching them about penetration in kindergarten. Like we're teaching them, you know, when you're playing with something and you ask, can you play with this toy? Or can I share this with you? Like you're teaching them about how to share with other people. You're teaching them about consent. You're not necessarily having to use the word consent, but you're building those like those soft skills of being able to interact with somebody that later build into what sex ed is all about. They're talking more about puberty. What does it mean when your body starts to change? Naming different parts of the body. And that's usually what gets all the, you know, that's what g makes them giggle. Like even I think back to my version of sex ed and it was pretty terrible the way it was done. It was dealt in, you know, in a very authoritative way and it didn't leave a lot of room for us to like laugh and like joke about it and to just get the funny part out of it. Now you can just talk about fact. This is the human reproductive system. This is how we have children. It's later in the years. It's more towards high school where you actually start to talk about the birds and the bees and, you know, actually what does it mean to have sex, sexual intercourse and actually define those. When they're starting to hit puberty, you start, you know, being able to name parts of the body. And it's not like they don't know either. They know that their bodies are different to other people, but it's just being able to have a, a safe space for the kids to ask questions rather than go through all this, you know, by self-exploration and access to, to tablets because of COVID. And it was great because it launched education programs like exponentially and it made them fantastic but it also gave kids this unlimited access to technology which uh, can be really really damaging to them when they have all these questions especially pertaining to sex ed that instead of asking their parents they go onto google instead <laughs> i completely support the idea of sex ed and i hope that you know i, I really wish that it had uh been more developed when I was around. Like it's not just talking about what is sex. We're talking about being able to communicate, work with other people, being able to understand another person, understand what does body language mean? If you say no, like it's all, it all builds on it and it's all done in an age appropriate way. Like it wouldn't have put something that would be inappropriate for this age group. Like it's something that's accessible for the kids to understand. Like you can talk about it in a way that's definitely easy for them to access. It opens up a line of questioning, but at the same time, you know, like it's done in a way that we're using, I know, anecdotal like uh, examples that they would be able to relate to, whether that's sharing something with somebody else. The health teacher or the teacher that's responsible for teaching the sex education program is required to send out an email to all the parents saying, we are gonna be talking about this between these dates. If you do not want your child part of that conversation, please let me know and they will not attend. So additional accommodations have to be made for those kids whose parents don't want them in there. That's a personal choice. That's, that's entirely up to the parents if they want their kid to be in that conversation or not. And I understand that and I respect their choice. I think if you're able to have that conversation with your kid, it just makes, it reinforces your relationship with them that you can be open, you can talk about things. They're not, they shouldn't be scared to shy away from questions that they have about puberty or that they have about sex or that they have about the other gender. But I also understand that some parents like don't wanna talk about it at all for you know, personal reasons, religious reasons, be what it may. In my opinion, I'm not quite sure what good it does if they're being pulled from it, because one, they're being singled out as, as the one kid that's not there. And then two, the rest of them spend the rest of the day talking about it anyways, so. They feel left out. Yeah. Talking they, about creating the community and the social yeah. uh, interactions. And that's, and that's just some, like, you know, it's a snippet of some situations that I've seen and I'm not, I'm in no way saying that it's every situation, mm -hmm. but you know, like kids talk, they're curious. That's just the nature of kids. So if you're having this big conversation, if you're hitting themes like that, it doesn't stop when the bell rings, like they're still curious. 
So they're still going to talk about it, even in the presence of other people that might have been removed from that situation. But again, like it's completely up to the parents and it's a, it's a family discussion as whether or not you want to be there and perhaps they want to do it their own way. And that's fantastic. The sexual health is a huge, huge aspect to them learning, learning how to be with other people, learning how to cooperate with other people. So you had sex ed when you were uh, going yep. back to school. Uh, so looking back into your kind of growing up years, would you rather have had that conversation with your parents? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, I would have. I would not have liked to have had this conversation at home. But I think it would have been beneficial to me, uh, for me and for my parents to just talk about it a bit more openly. It was a very like tucked in the corner, like you know, hush hush conversation. Like we did not talk about it at home. Sexual health. Like I remember in grade nine, like we were learning how to put condoms on a banana. Like that was as far as it stretched. And we learned about various diseases that you could catch if you were sexually active. And they were more scare tactics than they were actually teaching us about sexual health. It was just like, if you do this, you could get gonorrhea. I think there's also something curious about people giggling when these subjects yeah. get brought up, because I think the, f the sole fact that someone feels like they want to giggle when this is mentioned kind of indicates that this is a bit of a taboo. A lot of the issues that we face as teenagers, people growing up, and maybe even in, in later ages, especially in families where sex ed is taboo, those are the types of children that grow up to be maybe a little bit more vulnerable, are being, I don't know, abused or yep. unfairly treated. Knowledge is power, like just knowing things and just being aware, uh, it creates a better understanding of you with other people and you yourself can just feel more confident in that way as well. So, you know, like we're definitely, we're making moves and it's, it's moving in a good direction, uh, slowly but surely. What made you want to become a teacher? Oh, I did not want to be a teacher. But you do seem very passionate about this I right do. Now. I love it. Like, I, I complain a lot about my job just because of all the moving parts and just because there's so many things to, to keep in mind and, and to consider all the time. But I absolutely love what I do. And it honestly came by fluke. I, I got a summer job. I was offered to be a tutor at a tutoring company that I actually used myself. They just needed somebody temporarily for... Uh, a week or two uh, to cover some French classes because they had a teacher that was going away. And then from that, I ended up getting another job with the Canadian Explorer program. It's a bursary that you get that you have to apply for. They will pay for you to stay for five weeks somewhere in a French speaking community. And then you can learn how to speak French. You're completely immersed in the program. Um, and I, I worked for them for one summer and satisfying to, to see people, you know, there are people that went to that program not knowing a single word other than like bonjour and then came out fluent after five weeks. Like it was extraordinary to see. As the year kept going, I decided to pick up a tutoring job again. And then I just really started falling in love, falling in love with working with small groups of kids. My entire family had been telling me since high school pretty much that I was gonna be a teacher. And I just didn't believe any of them. And I didn't want to do the job my parents had, had done. But then like eventually just all, all these work experiences came up and I didn't get in immediately. So I had a year off between my studies. And so I volunteered in classrooms. I volunteered in a kindergarten class and I volunteered in a high school class. Absolutely knew at the end of it, I did not want to teach kindergarten. I did not want to teach high school because they all towered over me and they had so much attitude and sass in high school. I was like, no way I couldn't do this. And then in kindergarten, it was, it was, it was a challenge. From that, I kind of deduced somewhere in the middle. Can you share a little bit what the process of becoming a teacher looks like? It's an accredited uh, profession to be a teacher. So you do have to have an undergraduate degree and then you have to go and do your bachelor of education, which is currently a two year program. And so you need to have both in order to apply into the Ontario College of Teachers. So that's our governing body. In addition to being a teacher, you can also get a, a bunch of additional qualification courses, which we call them AQs. So you can become more refined and more specific towards various subjects. So for me, it'll be French. Uh, there's three parts to any course. So this could be religion, science, special education, indigenous education. There are various courses that you can take. And then from there, the College of Teachers will spit, like, will spit out a number and then you become a number in their system. You get put into their, you know, their big rotation of teachers. Uh, and then, you know, we, we pay every year to be in good standing with our college. And uh, you might have been a teacher in a different country, but they might not accept uh, your degree. So they might send you back to teach college and say, okay, you need to complete the Ontario Bachelors of Education program. And after two years, then you can, uh, then we'll accept you into our, into our system. Yeah. Is all of the application process purely paper documentation based or there is like an interview process or a letter of intent that you need to write? It's paper based. So you actually have to send it in. The College of Teachers doesn't interview you. That's up to the school board. Mm -hmm. So when you decide to work with a certain school board, they'll be the ones interviewing you and it'll be principals at certain schools 
based on where you apply to. So I applied to the Toronto District School Board, but within the city of Toronto, you also have the Toronto Catholic District School Board. District School Board, like it's all based on regions and where you are, so it just depends on where do you want to work roughly, and then you apply into that board. You're yeah. not applying for a specific school to work at, you're applying for a board, you go through the process, and then do you get to decide where you get to teach or is the school board allocate you it's, somewhere? But generally speaking, yeah, you, you apply to the board, and you should have say in where you end up. Can you still change schools? You can change schools because even as a contract teacher, you have a seniority list. So you have, our staff currently has about 25 people on it. There are some people on the staff that have been working for 25 years. So they're at the top of the seniority list. I'm at the bottom of the seniority list. When I look at the staff that, that I work with right now, there's at least six of them that have been working there for 20 plus years which tells me a lot about the community of the school. It tells me a lot about how much they love being there, which says a lot to me that this is the place that you'd want to stick around. Based on what you're seeing in your community and the overall challenges that you're experiencing in your day to day, what would you say are some of the potential trends or future things to expect from how the education system will evolve or how your life as a teacher will get worse or better? The way we use technology and the way it's implemented in the classroom, it's going to change exponentially and also the way I use it and the way my kids use it. I try not to use it as much just because they already have so much access to technology and like uh, I work in, in a neighborhood where they have a lot of resources at home and uh, it's really scary to see how trends that are trending on TikTok or on Instagram show up in my classroom because they're only 9, 10 years old, 11 and they're already picking up on things because they're, they're just like sponges. They just take everything and they just internalize everything and it's, it's terrifying to watch because I'm watching the same things that are trending on Instagram and TikTok and it's not all age appropriate. It's not, uh, it's not something that children should be watching, but they have so much access to it. And I know, you know, coming back to ChatGPT, I know a lot of high schools uh, and of course universities have had to take that into account in terms of, you know, submission, work submission. You have something called Turnitin, uh, which is just like a, a, a program that screens whatever you've written and then tells you what percentage is plagiarized. So they've now developed that in for, you know, for using for ChatGPT, how much of this has been plagiarized off of ChatGPT. Right now, what I'm really trying to harp on is just independence, independent thought, you know, being critical thinkers and not solely relying on technology to do the work for you is a huge piece of what I'm trying to work on. So integrating any kind of AI into the classroom, very cool, just not happening in my classroom. There will need to be a place for to teach children on how to work yes. with AI and to critically think about where AI use is appropriate or not. Yep. Um, I think one of the biggest risks of ChatGPT and AI in general is that it can make stuff up, right? Yes. So it's not a replacement for your own critical thinking, for your own research as well. There Absolutely. still needs to be a, a certain degree of fact checking and research and critical yep. thinking as well to yep. make sure that whatever that you're getting as an output actually makes sense. Absolutely, and my kids are doing a science project right now. Part of what I had to teach them was about research, how to research, how to use Google. Wikipedia cannot uh, guarantee the validity of any of its facts and say, so what does validity mean? And then we started talking about it and like, so what does that mean in terms of what you read on Wikipedia? If you're really stuck, this is a great tool because it gives you a really good starting point. And I'm not against it because I you know I told them I use it, but you can't base off base all your facts off of this. But it does not replace your brain. Exactly. Like you still have to, yeah, you still have to think for yourself yeah. and you still have to figure out how to do things for yourself. And I think uh, one of the things you mentioned kind of comes back to the importance of spending the first month getting to know the children, yeah. because if you don't know that, you can't tell what's their work and what's not. Exactly. So yeah. it kind of makes a complete circle on the importance of that kind of foundational relationship building. Yeah. A lot of people who watch us, newcomers or soon to be newcomers who are moving to Canada, um, who are parents or soon to be parents. Yep. So what are some of the words of encouragement or advice you'll give to parents who are scared or worried or are uncertain about what to expect from the education system? We, we love our jobs. We're in it for the kids and we want to we wanted do best by the kids. They're our top priority. Their safety is our top priority. Um, I know I, we've had a few students in our, in our school as well who have been recent refugees, given what's going on in the world, uh, who have come into the school, you know, halfway through. And 
you know, our main focus is what can we do to make them comfortable, to help them feel more settled. The first step is, is just to get them comfortable in the classroom. And this comes back to community and how you set up the community of your classroom and like knowing which kids that you can rely on a bit more and which kids, you know, maybe are shyer but could help this person open up, you know, is the best way to, to start getting them started. And then we have various programs, you know, if you're coming in as an older student who's new to the country, who maybe not be as confident in English, we have special programs uh, and we have dedicated people that come into the building to work with those students to help them give them a boost in their English English language so that could be reading that could be writing that sh that could be just oral communication sometimes it's small group work but what I've seen more frequently is just you know it's more one-on-one -on -one work just giving them a chance to get a little more caught up uh, to where they're at uh, and where the rest of their peers are at but kids are so receptive and kids are like they're so curious and they're so excited to have a new face in the classroom that it's just, it's so heartwarming to see them be so accepting of somebody new and wanting to get to know that person. So they'll, they'll do whatever they can. Like the kids, you know, as long as you're, you know, they get a bit of a heads up, like, you know, the kids know like, oh, okay, you know, maybe we could try this or maybe we can, you know, show this, show them how to play this game and just, you know, find different ways to incorporate them. And as long as you have that community established and the kids know, it can go really, really smoothly. And then individually as a teacher, you know, you're constantly trying to figure out like, okay, how can I make this accept, uh, accessible for them? Like, was it using pictures? Is it using, you know, uh, translation services to help them make connections to things? Um, you know, is it just giving them a baseline? Is it having some of my kids that are like way up there or even some of my kids that are lower down below build a better community and make them feel more comfortable and settled in the classroom? Like I, I bring a lot of it home. So like, it's not that when the bell goes and they go home to their families that we stop thinking about it. Like we're thinking about what can we do tomorrow that'll make it better or, what's going on at home that maybe makes them feel uncomfortable that we could do at school that gives them a safer space to to be or they you know maybe they've come from a, a really terrible situation like in a war-torn uh country where they're now coming here and they're they're you know, they're very frazzled by it what can we do to help them feel more at ease um and not doing it in a way that's just stereotyping that individual based on certain like, preconceived notions but like something that's very genuine um and from the heart that just really tries to what can parents do to make your life as a teacher better you know, it's great just to talk to your kid. How was your, how was your day at school? Fine. Like, what was fine about it? What did you enjoy? Who did you see? Or like maybe even asking more open-ended questions. Like you did, what did you do with your two best friends today? Like, you know, talking about uh, different social things. It doesn't have to be curriculum related. I think that's a huge part of what parents might think is that, you know, they come home saying, I learned this fact, this fact, and this fact today. When really the probably the best part of the day was recess when I was not standing in front of them and I wasn't <laughs> bellowing at them. And so like just being able to have a conversation with, uh, with their kid. And a lot of parents um, are very receptive and they really want to help their kid uh, and they want to do, do best by them. But, you know, also understanding at the same time that, you know, they need space to learn how to do it themselves. And space doesn't mean give them a tablet and give them, you know, the freedom to roam the internet. Space is just like, you know, okay, should we go to the library and explore this idea? Maybe we could, you know, Google this together and talk about it. Maybe this is a dinner conversation that we could have. It doesn't have to be, you know, a very long time consuming thing. It just, it could be a side conversation. Just, you know, being able to think aloud together and be curious together is a great way just to establish the relationship between home and school. Like they're not separate bodies. And I, I really harp on that with the kids. I'm like, this conversation doesn't just stop when the bell goes, when you exit the doors. Like this is part of your everyday life. This is something that will be more apparent when you grow up. And it's not something that you should just shy away from a conversation. Okay, so we're just gonna go through a quick uh, blitz uh, okay. of questions. And your goal is basically to answer them without thinking. What's your favorite subject to teach? Science. What's your least favorite subject to teach? Trauma. What subject do you wish you taught, but you don't? Gym. What subject do you wish existed to teach that doesn't exist yet? Home ec. It used to exist and it doesn't anymore. It used to be a program they ran in high school that they would literally just teach kids how to cook. What's the favorite question that you see your students ask you? Why? And what's the thing you hate the most about parents? Hovering too much. Getting overly involved. They believe that their kid is king of the crop and believe that because of that, their kids should get certain accommodations and certain ways of doing things because of that. If you were the Minister of Education, what would be the first thing you'd do? Definitely communicate better to the teachers of Ontario, listening to teachers that are actually working in the field because all these people that are making decisions on, decisions on behalf of teachers are not teachers themselves. They don't know what's happening in the classroom and they can't speak to any specific examples because they don't have any, or they're teachers that spent very little time in the classroom, so they don't actually know. So just being able to listen to teachers and take into account what they're saying, what they need help with, and what resources they need would be huge. And if you were the government of Ontario? 
I would be advocating for public education because the Ford government is really working towards privatizing education, which, uh, you know, private education and private schools are fantastic for certain kids and financially if your family can, uh, can afford it, like that might be the best uh, avenue for you. I'm a huge advocate for public education because at the end of the day, all your kids end up at the same university. So I'm not quite sure what kind of advantage or leg up it really gives you at the end of the day. Should there be more or less teachers? Well, there should be more opportunities to teach and that would come with a bigger budget. We have bigger class sizes because we have less money to pay teachers. Had we a bigger budget, we'd be able to reduce our class sizes, which would open up more classrooms and more opportunities for people to go in and teach. What's the best way for students or parents to thank you for your service? It's always nice to get parent emails saying that their kid came home so excited about something that we had talked about in class or gratifying to hear that from the parents. But it's even more satisfying and gratifying when you have a kid come up to you and say, I finally get it. They've been chipping away at it for so long or it's something that they've been really stuck on and they just look at you and they're like, you just see the light bulb go off and they're like, oh, I get it now. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I have poured hours into figuring out how to do this and how to teach it and how to make it fun or make it accessible. And they finally get it. It's just watching them become like more independent and become, you know, more abstract and critical thinkers. That's beyond, you know, it's, yeah, it's amazing. On this note of gratitude, I want to express my gratitude uh, for your time and for this engaged conversation yeah, and for all the work that you do for the children. It gives us hope about the future. Yeah.